Okay. Um, thanks for joining us. This is, uh, so I'm Leah from Teton County Library and I plan events and it is Teton County centennial anniversary this year. And so we designed this series to um, examine the history of Teton County in a broad spectrum. And I like the central question that Roxanne has in her book, Ind An Indigenous People's History of the United States, where she says, um, how does acknowledging the reality of US history work to transform society? And I like that. And you can also just substitute how does acknowledging the reality of Teton County history work to transform Teton County? And just to examine where we've been, who are we, where are we going? Um, and Morgan, do you wanna say anything about um, the centennial history of Jackson or anything like that before I introduce Roxanne? Um, sure, I'll just say a few things. Hi, everyone. I'm Morgan, the director of the Jackson Hole Historical Society and Museum. Um, and we're just really grateful to Leah and the library and our larger centennial committee uh, for, for being a part of these programs and kind of looking at this uh, bigger context. I think it's really, yes, well, uh, 2021 20, marks 100 years since Teton County was formed. There's so much more beyond just that specific date, I think, that contributes to who we are as a community, um, locally, as a state, as a country. Um, and so really just excited to, to bring this broader perspective to Jackson Hole. Um, so Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz is a historian, writer, and professor uh, in Ethnic Studies in California State University East Bay and a longtime social justice activist. She is the author and editor of 15 books, including Roots of Resistance, A History of Land Tenure in New Mexico and the literary memoir trilogy, Red Dirt, Growing Up Oki, Outlaw Woman, a memoir of the war years 1960 to 1975, and Blood on the Border, a memoir of the Contra War and the American Book Award winning 2014 and the American, Book Award, the American Book Award winning 2014 book, An Indigenous People's History of the United States and Loaded, A Disarming History of the Second Amendment. Not a Nation of Immigrants, Cellar Colonialism, White Supremacy and a History of Exclusion and Erasure will be published in 2021. So that is her brand new book um, that's coming out that we have to look forward to. And I'll turn it over to Roxanne. Well, thank you, Leah, and the Teton County Library for inviting me to help mark um, the Teton County's centennial anniversary. And hello to everyone with us. I regret that I can't be there uh, with you because I know it's a beautiful country there and wonderful people that I, I've never visited. In fact, Wyoming is the only U.S. state that I have never visited. So I plan to do that as soon as flying is possible again. Um, let us acknowledge that the Yellowstone Parkland and Teton Mountains are the most sacred of the unceded lands of the Shoshone, Crow, Blackfeet, Bannock, Gros Ventre, and other indigenous nations. This evening, I want to talk about indigenous knowledge, the land and human survival. Before 1492, indigenous Americans were able to support complex societies with extensive agriculture, as well as building large cities and towns. Uh, Mexico City, Tenochtitlan was the largest city in the world at that time. Uh, they built roads and irrigation works and all without degrading the environment. So the profit driven European invasion and destruction of those civilizations replaced them with non-food commercial commodities such as cotton, tobacco and sugar vast plantations worked by imported enslaved Africans. 
Cash crops and cattle raising began the destruction of arable lands. Then agribusiness moved into forest lands, built dams, destroying animal habitat and fisheries, degrading ecosystems. In the mid 19th century, carbon laden fossil fuels began to be released into the atmosphere. Today, we are paying the price while these destructive practices continue unabated. The colonial myth of a sparse population of Neolithic hunters in North America has long masked the reality in which the indigenous peoples had built economies and institutions that supported populations as large as Europe at the time. But without the motive of profit and accumulation of individual and corporate wealth, capitalist accumulation and land as private property were not inevitable developments of human societies as the Western idea of progress argues. Sam Gray and Raj Patel write about Native Americans' relationship to the land. Given the kin-like relationship to land, it is more accurate to understand its commodification, not as a deepening reification, but as enslavement. Just as people have a right to their land, the land has a right to its people. This is the logical terminus of a line of thinking that begins with the idea of the cosmos as a living entity. Muskogee historian Susan Miller explains, environmentalism based on this assumption holds that a living conscious being enjoys health or suffers illness. Ethics demands respect for the needs of such a being. Legal theory following this logic views any human practices that degrade the environment as assaults on a par with physical assaults on humans. Political discourse within this paradigm assumes that the invasions and occupations of indigenous lands have oppressed not only indigenous peoples, but also an untold number of spirits and the conscious land herself. So a long, an intimate long-term relationship with traditional territories also gives rise to indigenous systems of governance, social organizations, and science. Philosopher Gregory Cajete from Santa Clara Pueblo in New Mexico refers to this as native science, the practice and product of a lived and storied participation with the totality of creation entailing a wide range of tribal processes of perceiving, thinking, acting, and coming to know. There are serious misunderstandings and politicized science about the civilizations that preceded European colonization in the Americas. And there's much that can be learned from the social relations and economies of those civilizations. Humanoids existed on earth for around 4 million years as hunters and gatherers living in small communal groups. Some 200,000 years ago, human societies began migrating in all directions and their descendants eventually populated the globe. Around 12,000 years ago, some of these people began staying put and developed agriculture, mainly women who domesticated wild plants and began cultivating others. As a birthplace of agriculture and the towns and cities that followed, the peoples of the Americas are ancient, not a new world. The domestication of plants took place around the globe in seven locales during approximately the same period, around 10,000 years ago, 8,000 to 10,000 years ago. Three of the seven birthplaces of agricultural civilization were located in the Western Hemisphere, all based on corn. 
One was the South Central Andes in South America at elevations of 13,000 feet, terraced on mountain sides, a huge civilization. Another is Mesoamerica that includes the Valley of Mexico and Central America and Eastern North America from the Mississippi River to the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico to the subarctic. The other four early world agricultural centers were the Tigris and Euphrates and Nile systems in the Middle East, Sub-Saharan Africa, the Yellow River of Northern China and the Yantes River of Southern China. All of these civilizations preceded by 2000 years, the Greek and Roman civilizations that spawned Western European civilization. During this time of the development of agricultural civilizations, most of the same human societies began domesticating animals. Only in the Western hemispheric continents was the parallel domestication of animals mainly eschewed in favor of game management, a kind of animal husbandry different from that developed in Africa and Asia and adopted in Europe. I'll talk about that more later. Uh, we certainly know that uh, indigenous Americans were very capable of domesticating animals. They did domesticate the dog all over North America and Mexico and uh, in the Andes, they domesticated uh, the Yama. But in general, they had a different method. So in these seven areas of the globe where agricultural civilizations uh, flourished, they, these society, these, most of them were rather authoritarian. It's very different in the Americas but they all were in a kind of symbiotic relationship with hunting, fishing, and gathering peoples on their peripheries, gradually enveloping many of them into the realms of their civilizations, except for those, those in regions inhospitable to agriculture, where sparser communities on the move were stewards to the vast reaches. So that would, of course, be the Arctic and subarctic. Corn was central to indigenous American agriculture and was considered sacred. Traces of cultivated corn have been identified in central Mexico dating back 10,000 years. 12 to 14 centuries later, corn production had spread throughout the temperate and tropical Americas from the southern tip of South America to the subarctic of North America, and from the Pacific to the Atlantic Ocean on both continents. So you can see from that the interconnectedness of peoples all over this gigantic um, hemisphere of two large continents. The wild grain from which corn was cultivated has never been identified with certainty. Since there is no evidence of corn on any other continent prior to its post-Columbus dispersal of Western hemispheric foods, the development of corn is a unique invention of the original American agriculturalists. Unlike most grains, corn cannot grow wild and cannot exist without human um, air along with the multiple varieties and colors of corn. Originally, there were hundreds of different colors, each with different, um, uh, different varieties of, uh, of uh, vitamins, minerals, and, and uh, um, you know, they, different food um, uh, factors. Uh, Mesoamericans also cultivated squash and beans, and they also came in many, many different colors, many more than we have today, and shapes and sizes and so forth. And there were many varieties and colors of the potato cultivated by Andean farmers beginning 
more than 7,000 years ago. Many of the areas that gave birth to agricultural civilizations, uh, and this is the case where corn was the staple, not all, but many were arid or semi-arid. So cultivation required the design and construction of complex irrigation systems. In the sites of corn production, these irrigation systems were in place at least 2,000 years before Europeans knew that the hemis Western Hemisphere even existed. <clears throat> the proliferation of agriculture and cultigens, um, which are beans, could not have occurred without centuries of cultural and commercial exchange among the peoples of the North, Central, and South America, whose traders carried seeds as well as other goods and cultural practices. The vast reach and capacity of indigenous grain production impressed colonialist Europeans. A traveler in French occupied North America related in 1669 that six square miles of cornfields surrounded each Iroquois village. The governor of New France, following a military raid in the 1680s, reported that he had destroyed more than a million bushels, 42,000 tons of corn belonging to four Iroquois cities. Thanks to the nutritious triad of corn, beans, and squash, which provide a complete protein when eaten together, uh, the Americas were densely populated when the European monarchies began sponsoring colonization projects here. Destruction of indigenous food crops was the primary method of British, then United States colonial occupation and ethnic cleansing to make way for monocrop plantation agriculture. Corn itself in the 20th century became defiled as a cash commodity being grown for non-food usages such as ethanol, sweeteners, starch, cooking oil, and livestock feed. What little is used for food is reduced to two colors, white and yellow, the least nutritious. The total population of the hemisphere was about 100 million at the end of the 15th century when the Europeans invaded, with about two fifths in North America, including Mexico. Central Mexico alone supported some 30 million people. At the same time, the population of Europe as far east as the Ural Mountains was about 50 million. Experts have observed that such population densities in pre-colonial America were supportable because the peoples had created a relatively disease-free paradise. Uh, that's usually uh, commented upon uh, and, and then prefaced by why they just dropped dead um, when uh, encountering European diseases. But that's not how it happened. When they were raided, driven out of their villages and herded into um, uh, areas without food and, uh, and starvation, uh, famine, um, they were very, anyone is very susceptible to disease under those circumstances. But there were diseases and health problems. Um, they're human beings and um, there's always, uh, uh, there are always diseases. They live with us too. Uh, but the practice of herbal medicine and even surgery and dentistry and most importantly, daily hygienic and ritual bathing kept diseases at bay. You probably know that Europeans uh, didn't believe in bathing. Um, <clears throat> so they, they, uh, they did have a lot of diseases. Ritual sweat baths were common to all Native North Americans having originated in Mexico. So by the time of the European invasions, indigenous peoples had occupied and shaped every part of the Americas, established extensive trade networks and roads, and were sustaining their populations by adapting to specific natural 
stressful environments, but they also adapted nature to suit human needs. Rather than domesticating animals for hides and meat, indigenous communities created havens to attract elk, deer, bear, and other game. They burned the undergrowth in forests so that the young grasses and other ground cover that sprouted the following spring would entice greater numbers of herbivores <clears throat> and the predators that fed on them, which would sustain the people who ate them both. But it was like they were in there. Uh, they were free until they died. All these animals were free to roam where they wanted. Charles Mann in his wonderful book, 1491, describes the forests. Rather than the thick, unbroken, monumental snarl of trees imagined by Thoreau, the great eastern forest was an ecological kaleidoscope of garden plots, blackberry rambles, pine barrens, and spacious groves of chestnut, hickory, and oak. One European explorer marveled at the trees that were spaced so that the forest could be, quote, penetrated even by a large army. English mercenary John Smith wrote that he had ridden a galloping horse through the Virginia forest. In Ohio, the first English squatters on indigenous lands in the mid 18th century encountered forested areas that resembled English parks. They could drive their carriages through the trees. Bison herds roamed the east from New York to Georgia. It's no accident that a settler city in Western New York was named Buffalo. The American bison was indigenous to the Northern and Southern Plains of North America, not the East. Yet native peoples imported them East as they transformed forest into fallows for the bison to survive upon far, far from their original habitat. Historian William Cronin has written that when the Haudenosaunee hunted Buffalo, they were harvesting a foodstuff which they had consciously been instrumental in creating. As for the great American desert, as Anglo-Americans call the Great Plains, the occupants transformed that too into game farms. Using fire, they extended the vast grasslands and maintained them. When Lewis and Clark began their trek up the Missouri River in 1804, in the words of ethnologist Daniel Lott, they built, beheld not a wilderness, but a vast pasture managed by and for Native Americans. They created the world's largest gardens and grazing lands and thrived. Native peoples also left an indelible imprint on the land with systems of roads that tied nations and communities together across the entire landmass of both continents. One scholar writes, the first thing to note about early Native American roads is that they were not just paths in the woods following along animal tracks used mainly for hunting. Neither can they be characterized simply as the routes that nomadic peoples followed during seasonal migrations. Rather, they constituted an extensive system of roadways that spanned the Americas making possible short, short, medium, and long distance travel. That is to say the pre-Columbian Americans were laced together with a complex system of roads and paths, which became the roadways adopted by the early settlers and indeed were ultimately transformed into major highways. Now, all of this was appropriated by Europeans. Uh, there's no way they could survived uh, without all of this. This was an extremely well-developed, long-developed um, civilizations that they conquered and then dominated and moved the people out. So roads were developed uh, along rivers and along ocean ways. Um, 
A major road ran along the Pacific coast from northern Alaska, where travelers could continue by boat to Siberia, south to urban areas in western Mexico, and continued down uh, into South America. Uh, and that uh, highway um, exists today. That was a road built by the native people. A branch of that road ran through the Sonora Desert and up onto the Colorado Plateau, serving ancient towns and later communities such as the Hopi and Pueblos of the northern Rio Grande. From the Pueblo communities, roads eastward carried travelers onto the semi-arid plains along tributaries of the Pecos River and up to the communities in what is now eastern New Mexico, the Texas Panhandle, and West Texas. There were also roads from the northern Rio Grande to the southern plains of western Oklahoma by way of the Canadian and Cimarron rivers. The roads along those rivers and their tributaries led to a system of roads that followed rivers from the southeast. They also connected with ones that turned southwestward toward the Valley of Mexico. The eastern roads connected Muscogee Creek towns in present day Georgia and Alabama. From the Muscogee towns, a major route led north through Cherokee lands, the Cumberland Gap, and the Shenandoah Valley region to the confluence of the Ohio and Scioto rivers. From that northeastern part of the continent, a traveler could reach the west coast by following roads along the Ohio River to the Mississippi, up the Mississippi to the mouth of the Missouri and along the Missouri westward to its headwaters. From there, a road crossed the Rocky Mountains through South Pass in present day Wyoming and led to the Columbia River. The Columbia River Road led to the large population center at the river's mouth on the Pacific Ocean and connected with that vertical Pacific Coast Road. These extensive roadways did not stop at present U.S. borders, but continued vertically north and south. They indicate trade networks as well as cultural and language exchanges. They also facilitated European conquest. So this brief overview of pre-colonial North America suggests the magnitude of what was lost to all humanity and counteracts the settler colonial myth of the wandering hunter sparsely populating. These were civilizations based on advanced agriculture and featuring varied forms of government. It is essential to understand the migrations and indigenous people's relationships prior to the invasion north and south and how colonialism cut people off from each other. But those relationships have been in the process of being reestablished with the international indigenous movement of the past four decades. So the necessary changes to prevent environmental catastrophe will require more than sustainable development and an end to fossil fuel use. That's absolutely necessary, but it will also require a radically different relationship of human beings to one another and to the land. Indigenous knowledge is the key to that happening, but first U.S. society must come to terms with its past. How can we acknowledge responsibility? The late native historian Jack Forbes always stressed that while living persons are not responsible for what their ancestors did, and immigrants since 1900 were not party to conquest of the continent, they are nevertheless responsible for the society they live in, which is a product of that past. Assuming this responsibility provides a means of survival and liberation. Everyone and everything in the world is affected for the most part negatively by US dominance and interventions, often violently through direct military means or through proxies. The late historian and teacher uh, Juan Gomez Quinones wrote, American Indian ancestries and heritage ought to be integral to K-12 curriculums and university explorations and graduate expositions 
with full integration of Native American histories and cultures into academic curriculums. Gomez Quinones coined a measure of intelligence in the United States as the indigenous quotient. Indigenous peoples offer possibilities for life after empire, possibilities that neither erase the crimes of colonialism nor require the disappearance of the original peoples colonized under the guise of including them as individuals. That process rightly starts by honoring the treaties the United States made with indigenous nations by restoring control of all sacred sites to the original peoples, starting with the Black Hills, the Yellowstone, the Grand Tetons, Grand Canyon, Yosemite, and all those stolen sacred items and body parts. And by payment of sufficient reparations and land restitutions for the reconstruction and expansion of native nations. Today, half the indigenous population in the United States, mostly the younger people, must live outside the tiny reservation territories in order to find jobs and support their families and communities. In the process of this reconstruction, the continent will be radically reconfigured physically and psychologically for this future to be enthusiastically supported by the majority of non-Native populations, it will require extensive educational programs and the full support and active participation of the descendants of settlers, descendants of enslaved Africans and of colonized Mexicans, as well as immigrant populations. In the words of Acoma poet Simon Ortiz, the future will not be mad with loss and waste, though the memory will be there. Eyes will become kind and deep, and the bones of this nation will mend after the revolution. Thank you. I hope you have some questions and comments. Yeah, does anyone have any questions? Feel free to unmute yourself, raise your hand. I can call on you. Let me look. Thank you so much for speaking. This was incredible. Um, I was really curious to learn more about the importation of bison to the east. And um, I, I'm just curious if you have more information about how that process actually took place. That's fascinating. Well, you know, it has to do with the roads and the existing relationships. Um, for instance, the Lakota people kept being pushed, you know, when, when the Europeans came, they, they kept being pushed uh, um, westward until, the, because they were farmers. They were the people of the corn, you know, agriculturalists. And they didn't move, you know, be move because they wanted to, but that they, they then um, uh, joined other peoples out on the plains who, you know, the buffalo was the um, main source of, of food and uh, clothing, uh, you know, in winter um, hides and also trade, a trade with agriculturalists, you know, trade with the um, the great agricultural civilizations in, in New Mexico. Um, so they were very active and, and uh, in touch with each other all the time. So when the Haudenosaunee, well, you know, the Buffalo were also down in the South. They were in Georgia, they were all over the East. Uh, but I think it was the Haudenosaunee that with their trade contacts uh, realized, you know, this was a great source of, um, of um, sustenance. And um, so they, they simply started um, herding, you know, taking buffalo, at attracting them basically, like they attracted deer and all by, you know, the, what they planted. They, they learned what, you know, what it was that they liked out on the plains, what made them want to stay there. And they recreated those conditions. Uh, that would make them happy. Um, 
So yeah, it was really interesting. Um, it's something that people don't know. And for some reason or other, Buffalo, New York, you know, they never think, why is it a um, city in New York named Buffalo? <laughs> But I think it just, you just have to know that people were so in touch with each other and making exchanges all the time. The people on the planes were constantly trading uh, their, uh, you know, buffalo hides and meat um, for, for the food products that were raised in the Southwest and the Northeast and the South. And Shannon has a question. She dropped it in the chat, but do you want to ask it? Oh, it's so tiny. Why don't you read it to me? Do you read it? Read it? I, I could read it if you like. Okay. Um, so I just have recently learned that I'm actually descended from one of the 30 or so men that stormed the Pequot Fort on the Mystic River in 1637 under Captain John Mason. So he was likely there with Mason inside the fort. And it weighs really heavily on me, to be quite honest. So I'm, I'm wondering what can people like me um, do to be better allies to indigenous cultures today, considering the sins of our fathers, so to speak? Well, I think instead of thinking of being allies to be um, brothers and sisters, you know, and um, uh, we're all human beings, um, I think the, the, um, everyone's in a situation where they're related to education. If they have children, you know, if they have kids in school. Um, if they're teachers, of course, and there are many, everyone has relationship with schools. Maybe not everyone has relationship with universities, but everyone has relationship with schools, public and private and churches and community centers. So I think the best thing to do is, you know, not being aggressive or, or, you know, calling, you know, telling people they have to do this or whatever, but really finding ways to introduce um, uh, the educational content that should become like, Gomez Quinones says should be fundamental, should be centered in all education from you know preschool uh, through PhDs. When I did my um, doctorate in history in in the mid in the um, sixty four to sixty eight, never once was uh, in any history course I took. Um, there were no. American Indian history courses, uh, were Native peoples ever mentioned, including, you know, uh, I did Latin American history. And here, you know, you have dits, you know, 30% of Mexico, 70% of Bolivia, Ecuador, and the Indians are never mentioned even. So we have come a long ways with, you know, uh, some of us, really worked hard to create ethnic studies and <clears throat> it's been very successful in um, uh, finally getting back east. It used to be mainly in, oh, that's a thing in the West, you know, but now Harvard and Ivy League schools have this Phil Deloria Jr. His Lakota is now a full professor at Harvard in American Indian history. So we've come a long ways. It can be done. But I think the hard part is the uh, uh, the schools, you know, primary. To, that's when it needs to begin, because when you get in the university, then it's a choice, you know, and it should be a mandatory. So that's happening. My book was trans uh, was translated was adapted uh, to a young people's edition, not by me. I I didn't do that. Debbie Reese and Jean M Mendoza did a beautiful job. And I was just, I did um, uh, go to, to um, talk to teachers. I was invited to the Museum of American Indian in, um, there's one in New York and one in Washington DC. And every fall 
uh, before school starts, or actually in August, they um, they bring teachers together to basically educate them in American Indian uh, uh, studies. And they bring people in. So they brought me in as a keynote um, to talk about the adapted book. And I was really amazed um, at, at uh, the reception. And that book has just taken off wildly with teachers. You know, it, uh, they need to be given ideas. So first to learn yourself, you know, so you can present these things and, um, uh, Debbie Reese, who does this um, uh, American Indians in children's literature, she has a website, and I really recommend going to it because she also she she no book published for children or young people goes unread by Debbie Reese, who's from Nambe Pueblo in in New Mexico, and she critiques them. And she's begun, begun, uh, become the go-to person for teachers. So it's good to have teachers go look at, you know, Debbie Reese, what she recommends. And for parents, what they recommend, you know, for children's reading. Because a lot of these are preschool books. You know? So I think that, that would, be, to me, that would be the... Um, the most important thing that anyone can do, you know, in their community uh, and the churches too, to introduce, um, you know, the Unitarians who own the book publishing company that I publish with Beacon Press, um, they do a fantastic job, but they, they're a smaller sector than, you know, I grew up a Southern Baptist, they're the biggest Protestant um, and much harder to, <laughs> convince of these things but but I think there's an open you know people are open they don't know where to begin I myself think uh, sometimes how could anyone know anything about American Indians in this country you know I I don't really have a, a say well dumb people you know how are they supposed to know you know it doesn't it doesn't fall from the sky and the population is small enough and concentrated in the West more that um, they may go their whole lives. They probably do meet Native people and don't even know it. But, you know, the largest population of cities, the largest population of Indians is in New York City. And they're from all over the country, but mainly, you know, from upstate New York. Uh, and yet, very few New, York, New Yorkers will say, well, I've never, I said, you know, maybe your next door neighbor. Um, so that's, that's one of the problems is the lack of visibility. And um, also a kind of exoticism that people make people think, oh, you know, they have to, they um, maybe don't have the right or something. But the thing to stay away from is, is any nosiness about um, ceremonies and, you know, that's, that's not the right way to go. It's education about the history and about the uh, cultures and the governance. But most of the, many of the ceremonies are private, you know, and they shouldn't, and, but that's the main thing people want to know. I know I get letters all the time. Where can I go to, you know, to do this or that? I, I don't know because I don't do I I don't do it myself. So I don't know, and I wouldn't tell you if I did. So that's none of your business. Yeah, you know? I mean that you know that's off. But that that's a tendency, you know, people exoticizing uh, rather than think these are, you know people who work in coal mines and oil fields and truck drivers and, you know, in all walks of life and they're accessible, you know, and around. So thanks. Thanks for that question. That's Any other questions? I see we have a lot of um, <laughs> our conservation people on, on the, from land mm -hmm. trust and conservation Alliance. Any land questions or anyone else? Um, I'll do a quick question. Um, Eva from our Alta branch. 
I, I'm one of the librarians for, for Teton County Library um, and had the pleasure of actually in when I was getting my master's in library, being able to take a workshop with Debbie Reese and she's she is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. So I I, yeah. I would recommend everybody taking a look at, at her um, her website because she she really does due diligence for for um, looking through children's literature and and what depicts accuracy and what doesn't so it's she's excellent um i just was curious more about with with when you were writing and and some of how the research that you went into um writing the indigenous people's history of the united states and um if you could speak on any of kind of the difficulties that you found like having to retrace how treaties were written and then broken and written and how that process, if there was ones in particular that stick out in your mind? Yeah, one, one that I, of course, I don't know them all. There are really a lot of treaties. I have studied treaties quite, quite a bit, but the one that um, has been most contested and um, Supreme Court decisions and and is still uh, is still being contested is the Great Sioux Treaty. That's what it's called, the Great Sioux Treaty of uh, 1868. And um, this was a treaty. The 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 Sioux, which is you know many many different branches of um, they don't call themselves the Sioux, but the Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota, um, they they were uh, you know a very large region. Of course, they they migrated with the um, uh, with the buffalo as well. But they um, they gave up a good portion of their land in this treaty to have forever and ever a land base, um, the kind of center of their world and where the most sacred site was, the Black Hills, the Bahasapa. Um, this covered most of Nebraska, most of uh, all of South Dakota and North Dakota and part of Wyoming, um, part of Minnesota. And this was the Great Sioux Nation. It was to, to be forever and ever and um, then they began breaking this treaty, uh, these treaties. This is why before um, there was war going on, but you know the Sioux were winning, and it was the you know the United States was distracted um, with all their troops and in the South of uh, the Civil War, uh, both the Confederates and the um, and the uh, Union armies were fighting in the West, actually had battles with native people all during the Civil War. But they couldn't really, you know, the Lakota were too, um, uh, too powerful. The Buffalo were completely intact at the time. And um, after the Civil War, then the entire five of six divisions of the U.S. Army were moved to the Army of the West to destroy all the Native people of the West. And it took them, it took them uh, uh, 35 years to do that. Uh, but it was intense. And the first thing they did was destroy the food supply. They shot, you know, the army shot in mass. Um, they didn't, weren't even fighting, you know, the people. They were killing the buffalo. They had already been thin, but, you know, there were, there, there were 60 million buffalo killed within three or four years. This was, this was literally buffalo side you know, and that was their, because they had been surrounded and pushed, they had, you know, the trade routes were, um, 
were broken the, what, that I was talking about, the trade routes where they got, you know, food, vegetables, uh, dried corn, and all from New Mexico, these were cut off. So they became the f total food dependency upon the buffalo. And, and you know, the U.S. Army knew that uh, because they had been the ones closing them off. So when they killed them all, they, there was famine, you know, they were dependent in a dependent situation. So they, they didn't um, agree to the treaties that were made afterwards. The, the US, uh, it was always the military doing it, but they would simply go pick, you know, a few people to come and sign. They would get, um, people drunk, you know, Red Cloud, um, they got him drunk to sign off something. So they were just, um, it, they're illegal. Every, every treaty they made after that was illegally, they were not made by consensus is the way the, the Lakota people work. And at 1868 treaty, they had mass meetings, you know, it was fought out, they gave up a lot, but they got the security. So then they started in the 1880s allotting. So they end up out of this vast territory that was completely um, collective. They end up um, with these little islands of reservations separated from each other in South Dakota and a little bit in North Dakota. Uh, and the Black Hills were taken totally illegally by Custer. This is, he died, he died for that <laughs> later, but in the little bighorn, but um, he, he led his seven cavalry up and they found gold. And then there was a gold rush and then the US just annexed it. So that is the main, um, and you know, after World War II, the, um, they set up a, a Indian claims court to settle all Indian land claims. And um, they made a restriction. No land would be returned ever. It would be financial. So they made a decision without the Sioux cooperation because the Sioux knew that they didn't want the money. They wanted the Black Hills back. Um, and um, so there's, there's uh, like, it's now up to almost a billion dollars uh, that's in reserve and the federal government of that, of that, um, they offered them, I think it, at the time it was like $80 million, but it's in a trust fund. They won't take the money. These are the poorest people in the whole hemisphere and they won't take the money. They want the Black Hills back. It's their most sacred site. So I did a book on that. You know, there were Sioux Treaty hearings in 74 and I, w I, did, I was an expert witness. I wasn't an expert, but you know, I was recruited and I, I, learned, I tried to learn, you know, I was a specialist on New Mexico and the Southwest and I had to learn it all pretty quickly, but I had good teachers, you know, the Lakota themselves and um, so I was an expert witness, and um, it was a, a it was a, a um, it was about the Black Hills who lost, but the judge in the case, the federal judge, actually said, "You're never, you know, I can't make a decision. I work for the federal government. I can't make a decision that gives you back something. You're go You need to go to the international. You need to go international." So that's what, and that's what I got caught up in is this international work we've been doing um, ever since. So that, that's the most, but that's the most spectacular case, but there are hundreds of treaty cases like this that are uh, smaller in scope um, and, and not so dramatic as having well, you know, it is for the Mojave, you know, the Grand Canyon is um, their sacred territory and it's, it's taken from them and several other uh, people there, but they have been able to um, 
make, you know, they, they also, um, Congress did away with treaty making power in 1871. Um, so treaties with native people are not allowed now, but there are these agreements that get made. And one was that, as I don't know if this has been done at Yellowstone, but it has been done, um, you know, in Grand Canyon, that um, the native people are partners with the National Park Service in um, as stewards of Grand Canyon. And that's working pretty well. And I think if it were up to the Park Service itself, they would just hand it over because they're so impressed, you know, with the uh, knowledge that the Native people have uh, of the place. Yeah, thank you. By the way, uh, just kudos to librarians. I forgot to mention librarians are the best, are the most important people in the world. And so uh, open, you know, if you have, um, wherever you are, your local library, I mean, obviously Teton is already uh, uh, completely immersed in, 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 in this kind of thing, but um, wherever you are, if people ask you, I say, go to your librarian and um, suggest to them, you know, that they, you know, get my book or get other people's books, get, you know, get uh, books that are relevant to uh, the area. There are many, many good books now. You know, 40 years ago, there were very, very few books that weren't written by really colonial-minded historians uh, about Native people. And now there's so many great Native scholars and literature that, um, that are available and librarians are the key. So thank you. We have time for a couple more. I see Megan who works at in Grand Teton National Park. She has her hand up. And then there's a couple questions in the chat if we can answer those as well. Cool. Should I, should I go for it? Yep, go for it, Megan. Awesome. Yes. Um, I would love to hear you, so you mentioned, um, staying out of the religious ceremonies, which is a really handy, I think, rule of thumb. So, so I train other educators and interpreters in the park service. And there's always this phase where they learn enough to know that they can do damage and then they get scared and they don't want to talk at all. Um, so are, yeah. can you advise on some rules of thumb when you're non-Indigenous, but you want to make sure that the story gets told and, and kind of which zones to stay in and that kind of thing? Yeah, it's, um, I think um, the best thing to do is to um, locate, identify, and it's, it's not that hard to do, the, um, an elder or someone who's, um, who's very ready to be, um, very clear about what, you know, what is what. And um, it takes, and I think, ha you know, finding a, um, a person to, as a, a partner, you know, a guide to, um, you know, what's appropriate, and what's not appropriate. Um, I mean, there are, you know, things like that motorcycle rally and, you know, and, and that invades Pine Ridge every year, even during the pandemic. That, well, you know, things like that. That that's so inappropriate that um, there's nothing that can be done about it practically. But um, you know, some of these states, um, I would say, uh, are um, you know very. Uh, very anti-Indian, and um, so I think that 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 it's just um, I know you know I, in my mind I'm thinking of of certain things. I've been to you know a lot of national parks. The National Park Service, uh, you probably know this, but I was not aware that much until um, uh, actually 
just before the pandemic came down, closed things down, I was really developing a relationship because I got contacted by the um, local here in the Bay Area, the local um, National Park Service, uh, the, the one um, who does Alcatraz, and he wanted me to come out there and speak, and um, it didn't work out. But I met with, uh, he brought together all of the Park Service people in the Bay Area, uh, well, in the Northern Bay Area. It was about, uh, it's about 20 of them. And it was just, it just blew my mind how, well, first of all, they were all so young and how knowledgeable they were and sensitive. They were very mixed. Uh, they were uh, Mexican, Mexican-American, the, the, the guy who does Alcatraz, uh, who invited me, Mexican-American, a couple of uh, young black women, um, they were Puerto Ricans, and uh, of course, Anglo. Um, it was just, I was really impressed because I had, you know, um, uh, I, I just I just thought it was it was something that happened without me knowing it some transition in which the park service and surely it didn't happen with Trump you know <laughs> um, it probably would have gotten detected and suppressed uh, had he found out about it but that that it has really gone through something extraordinary and. And then I was in uh, the Navajo Nation and there are a couple of national park sites in, within the Navajo Nation that the National Park Service um, are stewards of um, sacred sites in, you know, in conjunction with the Na Navajo Nation. And again, I found um, the Park Service people there, you know, really really very good. So you all are doing something good. I mean, you your probably your role there are other people like that in those positions um but i don't think there's any formula i just think that sensitivity and reading they had all the ones here had all read my book and that's why they wanted to to talk with me and they um so i think that giving them something to read that's um readable and not just you know textual or instructions on doing this or that, but to really have, you know, develop their consciousness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Piper, do you want to ask your question? Are you still here? I can read it for you too. So Piper asks, um, what is your perspective on the significance of Deborah Holland's potential appointment to Secretary of the Interior, both in terms of visibility and real potential to address a long history of broken treaties? Well, I thought it was the most amazing thing that's ever happened in the US government that the thought that a, not just a native person and a woman, but a Pueblo Indian would be the uh, Secretary of the Interior. If, if someone had told me, hey, in two years, there's going to be a Pueblo Indian woman who's Secretary of Interior, I, I would say, are, are you crazy? <laughs> no, this was, um, you know, it, it was the, uh, they've had to bargain some with Bernie Sanders people, the DSA people, and there are a lot of Native people involved in DSA. And they made up their set of demands. You know, right now, one is $15 an hour um, minimum wage, but one was Deb Holland. That was their thing, you know, and there's this trade-off, you know, the way politicians do. But they, um, that's the most radical thing that any president has ever done because the Department of Interior is, is equal only to the Department of Defense it controls almost all of the federal lands and all of those federal lands were taken without treaties. They don't, the reason they can't privatize them, they would have been privatized a long time ago. They can't because they don't 
own them. You have to have, you know, they have their laws. They have to have a treaty, even if it's a messed up treaty that trans that transfers it. So they don't have any any documentation of owning the BLM lands, or the National Park Service lands. They're all just taken. So this is just the most extraordinary thing to have Deb Holland. She's a, I don't know her personally, but I know um, people at Laguna um, very well. Oh, she's, she's a mix Laguna and Isoleta. I know people in both places. They respect her enormously. She was raised to Pueblo. She was raised there. Um, and um, because that that's what I know best, you know, what I've studied most. And I know nothing about, you know, their religious practices because they're all in the Kiva and secret. But I know that they're intense, um, that they have a huge amount of responsibility in their communities and that she will be phenomenal. There's only, you know, I started to, at first I thought, oh boy, you know, these are the most powerful, richest people in the United States. Cattle barons, think of the Bundy family, you know, they, they are billionaires, cattle barons, oil and gas people, all, you know, the industrial, um, you know, the, the use of public lands at, um, and, and defiling them uh, with industry. I, I mean, it's, um, it's, really a, uh, it's a really an extraordinary thing. So I'm not sure how much she can do, but I think she will, uh, it will make a difference um, that, uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs is within the Department of Interior, and it is the least funded and the least, um, it's not, you know, uh, it's not representing a bunch of rich people like the other interests, the lobbyists. Uh, Native people have more lobbying power now than they did 40 years ago, but it's nothing compared to oil and gas and cattle, um, commercial cattle raising um you know or or um soybean uh commercial agriculture so um i'm sure she'll do everything she can to really uh raise the profile and the budgets and the personnel of the bureau of indian affairs and that alone if she accomplishes that alone uh giving native people the tools to fight you know for their for their rights, because there is a big movement on the part of these uh, cattle barons and um, oil and gas people to privatize all federal lands. I don't think they understand they, they can't do that. But what they could do is dissolve the reservations, you know, take the little land base that exists. They could dissolve it into just federal lands. Um, they couldn't really privatize it, but that's um, that's always a, a danger. They have tried it many times. They tried termination, the Termination Act of 1956. It was called that, the Termination Act, literally to terminate Indian existence, to dissolve all the reservations, to relocate people to cities and it took 20 years so the red power movement came out of that fighting it it took 20 years to get it reversed um and only with you know civil rights movement and um even martin luther king was was um uh, uh spoke about it um uh, and it took 20 years to reverse it and much damage was done uh, several reservations were liquidated I know we're at the near at the end of our time, but can we do one more question? I have one if nobody else has one. Does anyone want to it's take getting, it? I'm, I'm fading out because it's getting dark here. So. Oh, okay. 
Um, do you have time, one you more have time for one more question? Okay. <laughs> Um, so I like that you, I like how you framed it, that we should teach society that, that it's not a choice to not know the history of our country, like, and to start on that baseline level and that you gave, um, some things, um, to return to indigenous solids of the land, like, um, honoring treaties, restoring, um, control of indigenous sites, reparation, educational programs. Um, but how do we undo the capitalistic mindset that you were just talking about, about like land extraction and that kind like, I feel like that's so ingrained in our society. And then how to teach these things when we have this, this post-truth world that we're dealing with of like QAnon and that kind of stuff. How, how do we get in there? I know you said librarians are great and we like to think we are, but it's hard. How do we do it? Quick. Well, quick. <laughs> um, yeah, it is, you know, it's uh, private property is practically um, a uh, cult in, in the United States from its founding, you know, from the founding of the United States. Uh, I've, I've been doing work on the Constitution, how the Constitution itself um, is, is a, um, uh, it's, it's like the, it's like the, documentation of founding a corporation you know um, the u.s government was it was founded as the first capitalist state and capitalism's uh, bottom line is private property and in the united states that bottom line was real estate land and it still is you know even if it's a little you know a little block uh in a suburb the idea of having uh, your own home, your own land. Uh, and when the 2008 uh, financial meltdown came, it was all based on the failure of the real estate market. And they haven't really recovered that. So I think um, it has gotten tarnished, the uh, allure of um, private property. But you know, communal uh, land holding. This is what people don't understand. But you know, the reservations are the only human habitat in the United States where communal land holding is the rule. And there's such poor examples because of the poverty, because they have you know no support, no, no sufficient support. Uh, the intergenerational trauma um, is is untreated, so there's a lot of alcoholism, um, and you know there are many projects to change this. You know, and young people developing agricultural projects and all, but um, it receives very very little support. So it, and I think a part of the reason for not you know really allowing Native people to flourish in their land bases is that the system really does not want a good example of communal, you know, sharing of land, sharing of, of, um, and and you know, not having private property. That's why they imposed allotment in the 1880s. Uh, allotment only got stopped with the. Um, um, with the New Deal, you know, of a, a very friendly uh, anthropologist who uh, became the, um, um, you know, the head of the Bureau of Indian Affairs who had lived at Taos and understood, and he was a socialist too. They did allow, you know, some socialists into government during the New Deal because they were very dependent upon, you know, their uh, they were strong then and organized, and um, so they reversed it. But it was, um, you know, in Oklahoma, where I come from, except for the Osage Nation, um, every all of the reservations were allotted. What that meant is um, people got little lots of land, then they had to pay taxes on them, and then they lost the land. 
So there are very few even land, private land owners in Oklahoma who kept their allotments. Um, so I think, I think the rise of, you know, the socialism is a, is a word that can be used now, you know, with the uh, Bernie Sanders uh, campaign uh, four years ago, and then, you know, or five years ago, and then this last time that got interrupted by the pandemic, but um, he very likely could have won the nomination, but of course they, you know, he agreed they needed to, um, they could have, you know, carry that on in the midst of, um, uh, of the pandemic and also Trump uh, possibly winning. So I, um, I think, it, but it hasn't died off, you know, I think it's not a dirty word anymore. And socialism basically means um, believing in society and not just uh, rugged individualism. We need each other as human beings. You know, we, we are the most helpless of animals, you know, it takes longer for us to become uh, uh, adult, you know, fully functional alone than almost any other mammal. Uh, and, and so we're, we're helpless without family, without society. And I think people know that, but we need to enunciate it more. That individualism is, is not a positive thing and going it on your own, you know, and being able to tough it out like, Texans learned, you know, with deregulation and with, you know, a failed state, their legislature only meets every other year, um, a catastrophe can happen. And that, that, that uh, the first thing the governor said when people were, were freezing to death and all the power cut off is, oh, well, we're rugged individuals, Texans can take this. You know, and that echoes, I mean, he changed his tune after a while. Um, but this is, you know, I think an example of how we do need each other. People wouldn't, many more people would be dead there now if people hadn't helped each other out. And that's what we know. And we, we're up against a, a future of these kinds of catastrophes. We need each other. We can't afford selfish individuality, you know, that uh, all for me and nothing else. And that's a part of the QAnon and, you know, the cult of private property and the cult of selfishness. Uh, and Trump, Trump just, you know, embodied and encouraged all of that. And has done a lot of damage, reinforcing these things that were always negative, but actually giving a green light to the worst uh, aspects of them, you know, of uh, just knock down the person next to you. And now you see people, you know, because of his anti-Chinese rhetoric, knocking over elderly Asian people all over the country. You know, it happens every day here. I mean, just, you know, so I think we, we have to model uh, and, and, and lift up, you know, native practices as how they have survived the worst, you know, one of the worst genocidal uh, experiences of humanity, uh, losing 90% of their population in the whole hemisphere is not by being, you know, selfish individuals, by, but by supporting each other. And um, so I think, yeah, so I think there's a lot to learn from, uh, from Native people who've maintained those values despite all, not every single Native American, but in general, the majority. I think that's what Deb Holland will also model, you know, as she presents that, I think she will be a teacher about, you know, the federal lands being shared lands and uh, maybe we shouldn't have, you know, cattle overgrazing uh, the lands or maybe we shouldn't have 
oh, so many cattle, you know, and agricultural, um, animal ad agriculture that's causing these viruses, you know, there are going to be more and more of these viruses. So, yeah, we should take advantage of the night. We may have only four years, you know, but take advantage of this period when there is an openness uh, in the Democratic Party and those wonderful people in Congress the, that they call the squad and the DSA people and they're winning seats in state legislatures and set up DSA chapters, you know, get in touch with the, they're, they're completely autonomous, you know, there's no boss or anything, but you're linked up with a, uh, with a network of uh, DSA chapters and uh, can share information and and it's, you know, it's a creed in, uh, in, in the DSA, the Democratic Socialist of America, to, of um, collectivity and unity and mutual aid. And so I think, you know, I, I'm actually very hopeful if we can do a lot in the next four years and then maybe uh, it will be popular enough, people fall in love with it enough to uh, extend it instead of going back to Trumpism. It's a Thank very you. precarious time. Thanks for laying the groundwork for us to build upon. Thank you. Thank you all. And um, we're, I'm excited for August for your book to come out and the library will definitely carry it so you, anyone can borrow it. And we probably will have digital copies too for anyone to check out as well. And then next week we have um, like a continuation of this talk to um, from a different perspective, Todd Wilkinson, journalist from Bozeman talking about the American Serengeti, uh, the greater Yellowstone um, and how are we gonna go forward with developing this place? Is it inevitable or not? Um, and to look at that. But thank you so much for sharing your expertise and joining us here. And when you come to Wyoming, you have lots of friends now and I'm very, very excited for you to come and please, please, please look us up and we will. I definitely will. Thank, Thank you. you.